We are now done with chapter two in statics. We're entering a new phase of the class. Now we're going to talk about conservation of equations, conservation equations. We're going to talk about conservation of mass and then conservation of momentum and then finally conservation of energy. So first let's talk about conservation of mass. To do this we need um, a mathematical construct to work with first. So first we're going to talk about control volumes. And the reason we need to do this is with um, you know, in physics and statics and dynamics, you've, you've looked at the motion of objects. And objects are fairly easy to work with because they're discrete and, and you can track their movements and you can follow them. With fluids, it's a lot more complicated because they deform, they're continuous, and the, the molecules are constantly rearranging themselves, even within the flow. So how do you talk about a block of fluid and how it moves. And the way we're going to do that is with the control volume. Let's say we've got flow down a pipe, shown here. If we want to talk about conservation of mass or conservation of momentum of that fluid flow, the way we do that is first we set up a control volume. So we, we define a, sec, a, a section in space as our control volume. And then in, instead of talking about the water in general and the flow in general. We can now just talk about what happens within that control volume. And what we're most concerned with actually is where mass crosses the con uh, one of those surfaces on the control volume. So in this example we have a control surface on one side of this cylinder. And we know that flow is entering the control volume there. And then in a second surface we know that flow is exiting that control surface. So by analyzing the fluxes in and out of this control volume, we can really tell a lot about what's happening with the flow. <clears throat> That's a stationary control volume. The book talks about two other kinds of control volumes, namely a moving control volume. In this case, the um, control volume is not stationary in space, but it actually moves with the fluid. And, and sometimes this is useful if you've got like a a balloon that's deflating and flying across the room, for example. But it, it's rare that you'll actually need to use this. Um, the other type of control volume the book defines is called a deforming control volume. And this control volume changes in volume or shape to match the fluid. The book spends a fair amount of time on this, and the mathematics are, are quite complicated. Um, to be honest, I, I would never use one of these. The problems that the book asks you to solve by using this are actually easier solved just by using common sense. And I've assigned one or two examples with this. And, and you'll see when you get to it that you can probably just reason your way through the problem rather than dealing with all the complex math associated with the deforming control volume. So I would skip what the book has for this and just kind of use common sense. Um, I need to define a few things. We're going to talk about our flow rates in terms of mass flux. Mass flux is the rate at which mass crosses a control surface. So it has units of kilograms per second. And it's how much mass of, of water, or whatever fluid you're talking about, crosses a certain point per time. We can also talk about flow rate, and I'm sure you're familiar with flow rate. This is the rate at which the volume of a fluid crosses a control surface. So mass flux and flow rate are related. Flow rate deals with volume, whereas mass flux deals with mass. Um, flow rate can be calculated by the velocity of the fluid as it crosses this control surface and that cross-sectional area. Mass flux can be determined by the density times that flow rate. And then if you um, substitute in Further, it's the density times the velocity times the cross-sectional area. So these are really useful little formulas. Make sure you memorize these. I, they may be in the FE handbook, but you'd really lose time if you have to look these up every time you use them. We're going to use these a lot, so try to get familiar with them and be prepared to memorize them because it'll save you a lot of time and headache. All right, we can finally talk about conservation of mass. Um, it's also known as continuity. I'll use both terms, so be familiar with both terms. 
Now the book has a pretty involved discussion of conservation of mass. Um, this is to handle all kinds of situations. I'm just going to talk about, um, I'm going to make one assumption or one or two assumptions and just talk about that. If the flow is perpendicular to the control surface and there is steady flow, that is the flow rate doesn't change over time, and what that means is that there's no accumulation of flow within the control volume. If those things are true, we can use a simplified form of conservation of mass. And this is simply stated that all of the mass fluxes crossing all of the control surfaces have to add to zero. Now we use a convention, this is arbitrary, but it's a convention we're going to use for a couple different things. We use a negative mass flux for things that are entering the control volume and a positive mass flux for flows that are exiting the control volume. Another way of looking at this is all of the fluxes in have to equal all of the fluxes out. There's a further equation we want to look at as well. If we can say that the fluid is incompressible, and we've talked about this assumption before, liquids are considered incompressible. Gases are also incompressible if you're at low flow rates, that is, flow rates that are way below the Mach number. Um, if that's true, then the sum of all the flows have to be equal to zero. And we use the same convention, negative in, positive out. Or all of the flow rates in have to equal all of the flow rates out. So this is a really useful equation. Um, I encourage you to, to, to learn it because we're going to use it not only here but throughout the class. It'll pop up over and over again. So let's do an example where we have, we have three pipes coming together at a joint and in the first pipe, in all the pipes we know the diameter of the pipes and the first one we know the flow rate in, the third one we know the velocity out, and I want to know the velocity out in the second pipe. So we start by defining a control volume, which I'm going to define just as the joint itself. We have three control surfaces where mass is crossing the control volume. And since this is a fluid, this is water, I'm sorry, since this is a liquid, we can say that the sum of the flows has to be equal to zero. So let's go through that. Um, we have three flows crossing control volumes. Flow rate 1 is entering, so it's negative. Flow rates 2 and 3 are exiting, so they're both positive. Now, we don't know flow rates 2 and 3, but we know the velocity of 3, and we're looking for the velocity of 2. So rather than using Q, I'm going to use velocity times area for those two. So we've got our equation we, that we can solve. Um, let me take a few more steps. Flow rate 1 is in gallons per minute. Let's convert that to um, cubic feet per second um, and we can do that and then we need to know the areas for two and three or just we just have diameters so they're the same diameter so we use pi r squared have to convert inches to feet and that gives us the cross-sectional area of those two pipes and now we can solve for V2 and simply plug in our numbers and that gives us a velocity in the second pipe of 51.7 feet per second. Okay, so that's a straightforward example of application of conservation of mass. Let's do one that's a little more tricky. We have again a joint of three pipes and one of them entering is water. The other one has a different density. It's alcohol that's entering. We know those two flow rates and we want to know the density of the mixture coming out. So again we start by defining a control volume. We have three surfaces where we have flux crossing and we can write conservation of mass um, for those three surfaces. Pipes one and two, the flow, the flux is entering the control volume so they're negative. Pipe three it's positive. And we can talk about them, them in terms of density times the flow rate. Now we know density and flow rate for 1 and 2, or at least we can look it up for water, and we know what it, we're given what it is for alcohol then. Um, but for 3, we don't know the density and we don't know the flow rate, so we've got two unknowns. 
we can write another equation because these are liquids the, f the fluids are incompressible they have different densities but they are still incompressible so we can still make the incompressible assumption so we can say that the sum of the flow rates have to be equal to zero as well use the same sign convention and we, the t we know the two flow rates in so it becomes easy to solve for the flow rate out so our flow rate out is 0.4. We now have only one known in our equation. We can solve for row 3. And that gives us a density of 849 kilograms per meter cubed of the mixed liquid. All right, so that's conservation of mass. That's about as hard as it gets. Um, but don't overlook this. It's, it's a pretty simple topic, but it's something we're going to use over and over again. So make sure you, you get it down because you will definitely see it again.